Good morning and uh, welcome to Calvary United Methodist Church as we take our first steps in live streaming our services. Continuing in service to Christ means that we're going to have to address things, these interesting, challenging times, uh, by doing church a little bit differently. And, and I have to admit, this challenge ignites with me in a hope. Uh, the hope is that the Lord is presently empowering us to not only make connections with our current congregation members, but also with uh, new individuals, so that they too will become excited and, and come to the Lord's feast. Yeah, we. We probably have a lot more questions than answers right now, and, and I plan to cover a few of them this morning. However, as the, the Lord reveals more, we plan to keep people as formed as, as, as quickly as possible. For now, though, let's uh, take this time to prepare our hearts for worship as we sing, It Is Well With My Soul. the service this morning wanted to, to give you a few announcements. Uh, while, while the activities at Calvary have been canceled or postponed until further notice, that does not mean that we will not be ministering. In fact, one big way that we can minister to uh, is to, to follow the guidelines set down by both our governing officials and the bishop. Uh, doing your part to slow down the spread of coronavirus really is an act of ministry. One big question that has been tossed around is that of Easter. Well, at the present time, an, an Easter Sunday worship service in the church itself is within that time limit. And we've had suggestions from the conference and even conversations within the church that planning an Easter service for after the crisis is probably going to be what's happening. And, and as they lift those guidelines, we're, we're going to uh, um, announce that later. But but we will keep people informed with that. Another thing I want you to know is that Jennifer's role in the church office, well, that's vital. And it's our plan to, to, for the church office to remain open from 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. Without her, both church communication administra and administration would struggle a great deal. And that means that she is there to answer emails and phone calls if you need to, to have a question for her. Something else I want you to, to know is that the congregational care and, and um, connection are both vital to the church. In order to, to address this, a congregational care team is informed to assist you in connecting with and listening to, hearing about, and, and maybe even sharing what you ask for us to share. For instance, if, if you have a God moment or a praise, maybe even a prayer request, please feel free, um, uh, feel free to, to share it with them. Without this vital function existing within the church, ministering to people would, would struggle a great deal as well. Another thing I want you to, to, to hear about is a giving, offering, however you want to look at it, maybe even tithing. All of them are vital. I will speak more on this as we come to the time for the offering, but for now, I want you to, to, to recognize this. Every aspect of ministry would struggle without the offering. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. 
The last thing I want to share in this time of, uh, of announcements is that the Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit are not only vital, but they're necessary. You see, with, without them, we would not exist. They are why we gathered and worship, gather, why they're, they're, they're why we here to worship, they're why we pray, they are why we minister, they're, they're why we give, and, and really they're, they're why we celebrate. Quite simply, they are the most necessary piece in every aspect of anyone's life. And so those are the announcements that I want to give you this morning. There'll be more in the future weeks. But, but um, as we move through the service, normally we, we come to a time of what we call God moments, how God has impacted our life in one way, shape, or, or form. Now, I'm going to provide uh, um, with you, uh, um, everyone that's here, uh, with a God moment that hit me this past week. Even before last Sunday, I was concerned about uh, our present situ situation coming down the, sp the pike. And, and thankfully, as the announcement was made on Monday, a, a massive movement within more equipped United Methodist churches uh, was initiated to both educate and equip other churches with live streaming information. And boy, that has been helpful. As we listened and prepared, I realized how much of an opportunity this education would be for the ministry at Calvary in the future. It's somewhat like well, Joseph in the book of Genesis. Joseph had a struggle throughout of his life, but, but God was using him and God is using us or our present situation to equip us to connect with people who might never walk in the doors of the church. And so God has provided us with an amazing outreach opportunity in the midst of a crisis. So that is my God moment. Now, um, want to, to tear in our hearts to, to, to a time of prayer, whether that be prayer concerns or, or prayers of praise. Church, uh, prayer is vital. We know it's important to communicate with our family. It's important to communicate with our congregation. It's important to, to communicate with our community. And most importantly, it's important to connect with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And thankfully, we connect with him in a very simple way. We pray. So if you have a prayer concern or a praise or even a God moment, we'd like you to communicate those to us. And you can do so in one of the following ways. Call the church office. Email the church office. If you email the church office, put in there in the subject line, prayer request, prayer praise, God moment, maybe even all three. You can email me with the subject line, prayer request, prayer praise, or even a God moment. And finally, let me say this. Let the congregational care members who are calling you know about your prayers of concern, prayers of praise, or even God moments. And as you share those things, if you want them to be kept private, if you only want them to be shared with you or with the pastor, please let them know that. You see, we want you to know that your prayer requests are only shared with the pastor. Beyond that, they are kept private unless you specifically note that to us. So I'd like you to, to join me as we pray for those who are deeply concerned about whatever it might be in the world. And so I'm going to walk through a prayer and, and give you a few moments just to turn your hearts and minds to whatever that might be in your own personal life. Join with me. Oh Lord, we pray for those of our, our loved ones who are in ill health. We pray for those who have been or will be impacted, whether that's directly or indirectly by the, the coronavirus. We pray for our nation's leaders. We pray for the local leaders.
We pray for the first responders. We pray for all the medical personnel inside the hospitals and those who are in the clinics. And Father, we pray for our churches as each and every one of us seek new ways of doing church so that others will also become excited about coming to your feast. And so, Father, we lift up each and every one of these prayer requests, but we also recognize that we give you praise for each of the above mentioned requests. You see, Father, with, with every prayer concern, we are reminded of reasons to give you praise. Without the church, people would struggle to connect with you. Without leaders and medical personnel, people would struggle with their health and they would suffer. And without others, for us to love through their struggles, we would, would not we would not know or even understand how much you have loved us. So we give you praise because of your great love. And we pray just as your son taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, uh, for those who haven't noticed or maybe are unfamiliar with Calvary's worship service, I've done my best to follow the order of worship that we have. Started off with the welcome opening song, went to the announcements, had a time of God moments. We've had time for, for prayer concerns and, and praise. We've, we've prayed the Lord's Prayer, and, and now we come to the, the time of the offering. I'm reminded of the Lord telling Israel in Malachi chapter 3 to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. And the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. And so as you hear this passage, I want to ask you a question. Do, do you truly believe what the Lord promises to us? I'm pleased to say that Calvary's congregation has been faithful and is faithful and will continue to be faithful. Yet there may be many of us wondering, well, how can I give? Well, one of two ways. First of all, I will personally testify to the fact that the post office is still open. I know this because I have been continuously cleaning and sanitizing along with Cinderella. Yes, you can mail your offering and they will deliver it to the church. The second way is you may bank online. And if you bank online, well, you're likely familiar with bill pay. Bill pay your offering to Calvary. And guess what? the post office will also deliver that for you. Either way, they'll both get to the church. But here's the, the point that I think I want to really point out. And then most importantly, each of us should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Paul writes that to the church in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. So I'm going to take a time and we're going to pray over the, the offering that, that you are considering to, to mail in and, and, and ask for the Lord to bless it. So let's pray. Oh, Lord, we ask that you bless the tithes and the offerings that are given today. Let the majesty of the Father be the light that guides us. And compassion of the Son be the love that inspires us. 
and the presence of the Spirit be the power that empowers us. And it's through Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Now, we normally read the scripture passage this morning and and on Sunday mornings, and and this morning I think I want to add it into the the whole message. And and um, as we have been walking through the uh, the Lenten season, um, we've we've been doing a series called "Listen to Him." And and last Sunday we were listening to Jesus and in, in his. Um, uh, conversation with the the Pharisees and the experts of the law in chapter 11, Luke chapter 11, and they were sitting around a table eating a meal. And that meal, well, it, it sparked a series of confrontational woes from Jesus. And those woes were meant to put the G, the Pharisees in their place, but also to, to wake them up. Now, as we read today's passage. We're going to be reading it from Luke chapter 15, and we find Jesus is sitting at another, at another table, but this time he's sitting with the tax collectors and sinners, and this table sparked three of the best known and beloved parables in all of scripture. So as we begin to listen, I want you to lean in and listen to Jesus tell this as he seeks out the lost so that he can bring them to the feast. Verse 1 says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and, and eats with them. I'm going to stop right there, and I want you to ask yourself, how does one determine who a sinner is? How? Well, the Pharisees believed that the tax collectors were the sinners. And Jesus had decided to eat with these sinners. Now, I want you to lean in and listen some more as Jesus seeks out the lost so that he can bring them to the feast. And we're going to start at verse 11. And so you're going to skip down a couple of verses. And in this passage, he says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me a, a share of the estate. So he, he being the father, divided the property between them. Not long after that, the youngest son got together all he had, set off for a far country, and, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. And so here we have Jesus telling the parable. And Jesus' listeners, the tax collectors and the sinners, they're sitting around the table and they're listening to it. And they had begun to settle into their places inside this parable. I want to ask you a question as we begin to start. Have you settled into one of the people in the parables? Is it the father? Maybe it's the oldest son. Maybe it's the youngest son. Who have you settled into? We're going to talk a little bit about the, the youngest son right now. And the depth of disrespect by the youngest son raised the stakes of this whole meal. You see that the religious leaders would have been outraged by his actions. His actions, this youngest son's actions, cut against all of the long-held cultural um, of, of honor and, and in shame. The sinners and tax collectors, on the other hand, well, they would have felt the sting as well. They, they knew all too well what it was like to be outcasts. And as both of the groups listened to Jesus, they recognized that Jesus had drawn the lines. Each group took their defined place in the parable. And so here we have the younger son who sets off and he lives this extravagant life. The wealth that had been earned or, or cultivated and preserved for generations was quickly and recklessly wasted in this young man, young son's wild living. The youngest son saw only the present moment. He had no memory of the past. He had no vision of the future, and he really didn't care about those who came before him, nor those who made uh, those that um, would come after him. You see, we need to realize that the younger son in this parable uh, helps us to understand how sin really works. You see, sin in this youngest son 
elevated him or it, elevate, it elevates a person and it situates them, situates them at the center of the whole thing. And it begins to isolate them in that moment and makes that moment all that exists. You see, sin wants us, wants you, wants me to ignore the consequences and the damage of that moment. Still, here we have Jesus telling this parable, and he's seeking out the lost so that he can bring them to the feast. And this is where he begins. The next thing he says in verse 14 is, after this, after he had spent everything, he being the youngest son, after he spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything to eat. So here we have this youngest son who has elevated himself and isolated himself in all the ways to experience the world. And all of that has come crashing down in this one momentous collapse. And his wealth ran out and his world caved in. It's kind of like, well, maybe even me, maybe others today, who lived with their parents and they depended on their parents' wealth. Eventually, though, they, they go out and they get a job, right? And they finance a car or they rent a home or a, an apartment. And they find themselves living paycheck to paycheck, struggling every single week. And then they lose their job. It's tragedy, right? Well, at some point, this son's tragedy was compounded with another tragedy, a famine. And he fell further than he ever had imagined possible. Maybe that hits home with someone around here. And here's the son, the youngest son, who eventually was forced to hire himself out by feeding pigs. Now, let's realize that feeding pigs is disgusting for us. But in a Jewish society, pigs were not only disgusting, they were untouchable. And so at this point, the audience is really leaning in, and they're really listening to Jesus because this parable made perfect sense within the culture of their day. It's a morality play, warning against a sinful life. And the tax collectors and the sinners, they were feeling the sting of the conviction of his parable. And the Pharisees would think, well, close the curtain. This youngest son has got exactly what he deserves. Ironically, what one in that table might have thought was the end of Jesus' parable is also a starting point. When everything comes undone, comes crashing in upon him, the Lord provides a chance for this young man, this youngest son, to be remade. As he hits rock bottom, the Lord wants us to realize that that rock bottom can jar someone awake. And so from what rock bottom do you need to be jarred awake? From the youngest son, it was his reckless living. And it says in verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father's house. And so here we have the youngest son's rock bottom moment, which had jarred him awake. He came to his senses and he remembered his father's amazing character. And he decided to risk his future on his father's grace. The humility of serving in his father's house was a far better decision than the humiliation of starving on his own and feeding pigs. So what did he do? He decided that he would go home and apologize. Now, remember, this is a morality play. It's a morality parable. And we have the Pharisees 
who were gratified by this youngest son's misfortune. And they began to gloat at the father scolding the youngest son as he returned home. On the other hand, we have the sinners and the tax collectors who are feeling the sting and were anxiously preparing their hearts for the, for the father's scolding. Yet the beauty of scripture is that it's brimming with the depth of God's love. All over, you can read about these amazing stories of God's love reaching out to his people. But apart from the cross, few passages compare from these few verses. It's the image of a father running out to meet a child who has come home. And it says in verse 20, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, and it was filled with compassion for him. He ran out to his son, he threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Maybe you remember a time when your apology speech was interrupted by this type of welcome that took you by surprise. You see, that's how Jesus's parable hit. The the sinners and the tax collectors. We all have some form of an apology speech to someone. And I want you to know this. The Lord's arms are still wide open. He is still running toward his wayward sons and daughters. So why not experience his welcoming embrace today? You see, Jesus is always seeking out the lost so that he can bring him to his feast. And it's interesting to note that we often end Jesus's parable, this morality parable, with the beginning of this celebration feast. As we marvel at the grace of God who has rescued his wayward son. But the truth is, Jesus's parable isn't over. His grace has far more ground to cover. He says in verse 24, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again, but he is, he was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When the father, when he came near the house, he heard the music and the dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him what was going on. Your brothers come home, he replied. And your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all of these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill a fatted calf for him? Jesus' parable is not just about the younger son. Jesus' parable is about both of the sons. The older son, who is still outside, refuses to come in. And here he is offended by his brother's actions and offended by the shame that's been placed upon his family. Jesus' morality parable, his morality play, his point is this. Both brothers shared the same sin, the sin of pride. One says, I don't need you. And the other says, you owe me. One says, I want my freedom. The other says, I want my due. One says, I deserve the chance to leave. And the other says, I deserve credit for staying put. The only difference in the two brothers 
is that one returns and the other refuses to come in. But the beauty is that the father goes to both and he invites both to the feast. Now, do you remember the complaint that started all of these parables? The Pharisees said, he welcomes sinners and he eats with them like old friends. And Jesus answers their statement, yeah, I do. I welcome and I eat with all who sin. Your brother who was dead is now alive. Now, are you going to stay outside or will you come in and join the party? And that's how Jesus' parable ends. It ends with everyone hanging on Jesus' words. There's no resolution other than the listeners and or readers today faced with how they will respond. Jesus' listeners around the table had their place in the parable. And they are likely all to be surprised by the plot twist. Jesus seeks out the lost so that he can bring them to his feast. How will you respond? Are you coming to the feast? Let us pray. Oh Lord, we acknowledge that Jesus is your son. And we want to say Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory, your glory, divine. He is the heir of salvation, your purchase, born of your spirit. And Father, we, we say wholeheartedly that we have been washed in his blood, and we are coming to the feast in your home. And it's in your son Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. go forth, uh, recognize this, that God seeks out the lost so they can bring them to the feast. Who are you going to tell? How will you respond? Let us go now knowing that we're going to gather again here on Facebook and, and also on Zoom, and, and our hope is to post this to YouTube, though uh, we're not quite sure if that how it's going to work just yet. But, but go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.